But we have been having an awesome time here last Sunday on our Monday Leaders Meeting and again this morning with Kerry Robertson. And um, there were some miracles happening here this morning. There were some people healed, released from pain. Well, oh, yes, come on, that was awesome. Yes. <laughs> That was absolutely incredible just to watch it all happening and thank you so much. So I'm going to be inviting him up here in just one moment for the last of his series is, is in the series of con being a conqueror. It set us up and challenged us for 2020 to be active in the things of God that God has called you each to do. So that has been his theme. It's been an awesome theme. Uh, last Sunday morning, this Sunday morning, we've taken up an offering for Kerry and his wife, Rianne. They're believing to start and plant a church in America in Dallas, Texas. And so if you've missed that moment but would like to give into that vision, please do so after the service. Glenis will be at the FPOS facilities there. We've known Kerry and Rianne for many years. I forgot how many but he is an awesome ministry, a church planter, a great pastor to your people, a born evangelist who just loves to see people coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord. But you have been also exhibiting faith like is incredible, vision like is awesome. You've inspired us, you've challenged us, you've felt like a friend and one of us. But in the place of Brent here tonight, I would like to welcome you for the final time here to bring what God has put on your heart this very morning for us here at Encounter. Let's stand and welcome him. Thank you, church. So again? good. So good. Come on, can we put our hands together for Jesus in the place? So good, so good. I'm pumped. What a great time I've had here. I feel at home in this place here. It's a beautiful thing. I, I, I was just thinking a moment ago, I remember as a young adult dreaming of one day preaching in this church. True story. And I was just like, man, if I, if I preach at an Encounter Christian Center, I have made it. And that is the, that is the true statement right there in that place there. And uh, it is a great privilege to be a part of this place. And, you know, if you're a young buck in this place and you feel like there's ministry in your bones, what you've got to understand is that, you know what, dreams come from God. What you got to understand is this, is that, you know what, one of the doors that God gives you to unlock doors of ministry opportunity is called honour. And it's one of those missing ingredients that a lot of people, whether you're young or old, you miss. And you wonder why sometimes doors don't open up for you. It's because you've never found the key of honour. And I honour you. I honour you of the many decades of sowing and sowing and sowing and no matter what the season is you've been sowing the gospel planting seeds into lives planting seeds and seeing God do some incredible things and the stories and the legacy that you've left and what a great legacy it is, is that not only have you sent people all over this nation people all around the globe you've sent your pastor and allowed your pastor to go to other nations at the uh, you know, so, some tough seasons of this church, but you've sent your pastor. And you know what? There are lives out there. I'm telling you, there's going to be a season when you walk into heaven and in that season of heaven where you get to have 100-year conversations, you'll meet people that say, thank you for releasing your pastor to come to our nation to preach the gospel. I'm not saved. But be, I, so I would never got saved unless you'd released your pastor. I believe there's going to be those sorts of conversations. But I honor you. Thank you and understand that behind every incredible man is an amazing woman that uh, has made that happen. I, I think it would be honorable for us to put our hands together and uh, thank Patricia. We probably often thank the, 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 the man and we, uh, we, we do that. But last week, what a beautiful thing was to pray, to lay hands and believe God for our pastors in Jesus' name. And so can I just enc encourage you, honor, honor, just keep doing that in that space there. It's a beautiful thing. Well, I, I had plans. But you know what? Uh, sometimes God goes, you know what? They're your plans, not my plans. And that was one of those things. I came into uh, this 
I guess, weekend with plans of what I felt like God would do today. And uh, you know what? We had an incredible morning this morning. and God moved incredibly power, uh, powerful in that space. It was a beautiful time that we had. I, I loved it. But I had plans for tonight. But when, during the worship, what happened was I felt like God goes, well, that's, that's nice that you have plans. But this is where I want you to go tonight. And uh, what happened was, is that I, I, I saw in a moment where uh, Abram, this is during the worship this morning, Abram in his tent. And while he was in his tent, uh, I, I saw him get out of his tent and look up to the stars. And uh, I felt like uh, the Lord say, there are some that have walked into a season or been walking in a season of disappointment, setbacks, hurt, betrayal, and failure. And you've retreated to your tent in depression and anxiety. And all you can see is the insignificance of what's in front of you. But tonight I'm calling you out of your tent to stand and look up at the stars, the promises that I have for your life. I believe that God wants to minister to you tonight. He wants you to come out of your tent. He wants you to come out of your depression. He wants you to come out of your anxiety. He wants you to come out of what you're seeing in front of you. And all you can see is insignificance. All you can see is survival. You can't see the promises of what God has got for you. And He's saying, it's time to come out of your tent. And that's what God's going to do tonight. God's going to bring you out. You might say, well, I'm out of my tent. Well, you know what? He's going to bring you into a, a bigger place over the coming minutes. So Father, we right now, we invite you. Holy Spirit, we invite you to walk down every aisle, through every seat row. Would you touch lives? Father, I pray and believe, Father, there are people, Lord God, that have, Father, retreated to their tents. In fact, God, they've not just zipped the tent up, Lord God, they've put locks and put padlocks. Now, Father, they've found themselves in a place of survival found themselves in a place, Lord God, where th this is safety for them, Lord God. But Father, I, I declare in the name of Jesus, every lock, every chain even of the enemy, Lord God, that's come around that tent, Lord God, would be broken. And Father God, that they would find themselves, Father, advancing forward out of that tent, out of that survival mentality, found them in a place where they would dream again. We declare in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 37, it's a beautiful thing. Thank you, Mr. Keyboard. Appreciate you behind me. If you, if you could just hold pad, that would be great. If that's possible, just move to that space there. Uh, we're looking at Genesis chapter 37. That, that's where we're heading. Genesis chapter 37, we're going to be looking at one of the sons. This morning we preached about uh, a man by the name of Jacob. Jacob. His name was changed to Israel, and he had a few sons. When he got to an old age, we come here to this chapter in verses 37. It will come up behind me. I'm reading from uh, an NLV Bible. Jacob lived a lot in the, in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers. Let's go down to verses 3. Now Israel, right, the other name of Jacob, Loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he'd been born to him in his old age. He made a rich ornament robe for him. His brothers saw that his father loved him more than them. They hated him. They could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream. When he told his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen, this is a dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field and suddenly a sheaf rose and stood upright where your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream of what he had said. And he had said, and that, that in verses nine, then he had another dream. And he's told his bro brothers. And the, the story goes on that, you know what? He just kept dreaming. Joseph was a dreamer. And, 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 and I just want to see those, those key words. He had another dream. Joseph dreamed again. And if we look at Joseph's life, he was the youngest. He was the least in the family. Maybe you're in the place here tonight. Maybe you feel like you're the least. You may be actually the youngest child, but maybe just 
just just what, whatever's going on in your world right now, you feel like you're the least. You feel insignificant. You feel unimportant. You feel like a nobody. Maybe your circumstances, maybe your situations, maybe you've gone through a storm. Whatever you're facing right now, you feel insignificant like Joseph, the youngest, the most unimportant per- per- person in that family, the least in the family. Now he was loved by his dad incredibly loved by his dad. And you need to know this, despite how you feel, there's a dad in heaven. His name's Daddy, Papa. We're talking about our almighty God in heaven. He loves you and He incredibly favors your world. Despite how you feel, He loves you. Some of you need to hear those words. You're loved. You're favored. God loves you dearly. He's proud of you. And we can feel insignificant like nobody, but He loves you and He wants to bestow gifts upon gifts upon your life. I love the fact that the Bible says, I think it's in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3, that daily He, he brings blessing into our world. Daily. Loads us up with His blessings. I mean, He puts that word loads us. I, I, I mean, I mean it's, it's not like, you know, just oh, here, here's something for you. He loads us up. Depending on your mentality, you, you might have like a bucket mentality where all he wants to do is give you a bucket load. Or, or you could have like a wheelbarrow mentality where he's showing up with, 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 with a wheelbarrow of blessings to you. But come on, I, I, I can just see a, a, a big mad truck, two trailers backing up, dumping loads of blessing on my life. You are highly favored. You need to know that. But maybe you feel like Joseph, insignificant. And so here we have a dreamer. And as a result of him being the least, he was hated by his brothers. And, and you know what? Sometimes he spoke out a term, but that's what younger ones do and significant ones do, trying to, I, I guess, get some attention at times. And so they hated him. And, and to make it worse, they would speak uh, words that didn't help. In fact, it actually says here that they didn't speak nicely to him at all. And they grew to hate him daily. That hatred built up. Uh, that, 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 that's how it was. And eventually, if you read on, what happens is they end up selling him to, into slavery. I, I mean, you're the favored child. You're loved and doted on. And now the ones that should love me, my own flesh and blood, they hate me so much that when I'm out on the field with them, they sell me to slave labor. And you know what? I'm going to look back and probably I'm never going to see my family again. That's how he was feeling at that time. And, and what happens is, is that they would tease him. And, and, and even, even it says here, prior to him being sold into slavery, whenever he showed up, they go, here's a dreamer. Here's a dreamer. Maybe that's the words that you've been spoken over your world. You're just a dreamer. Just a dreamer. Well, thank God he's a dreamer. But, but see, what's the significance of the story is that Joseph had some setbacks. He was mocked, he was pushed back, sold into slavery, yet he kept dreaming. He never gave up on dreaming. See, he, 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 he started out a winner, and guess what? He finished a winner. And you, you need to know all in this room, every one of you are winners. Can, can I just reinforce this? Your circumstance may say I'm not a winner. Your bank account may not say you're a winner. Your, 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 your exam results may not say you're a winner. But can I speak to you and say to this, you're a winner. And so if you started out a winner, don't finish up a loser. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 5, it says, Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew who you were. I set you apart and I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. God knows everything about you. But, but I love that. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, one of those thoughts that none of us want to think about. The moment where mom and dad, but dad looks at your mom and says, I'm a ding ding, look at the legs on that thing. And then there was a magical moment that none of us want to think about. And, and at that moment, there, there was a race. You're one in 400 million and you're running. Woo! I'm going. I mean, you, you're running, you were out in front. And it was the first person that got to the, to the finishing line that won the race and the, the prize was called life on planet earth. I tell you this, that you know what, it's a horrible thought none of us want to think about. 
especially if you're sitting next to mum right now, especially if your parents are in the room right now. But I just tell you this, you started out a winner. Don't finish life as a loser. Can I say that again? Don't finish life as a loser because you started out a winner. Come on, you get the opportunity to be a winner again. It's a beautiful thing. So, so the thing is this, is that, you know what, I found in life that, you know what, life has its way of beating out the dreams. Moments where, you know what, as kids, we used to dream. It wasn't hard for us to dream. We'd just watch a, a movie about Craddy Kid and I was gonna be the next Craddy Kid. The next movie, Fireman, guess what? I wanna be a fire truck. Uh, you hear what I'm saying? Like, like I, I just, just, I know you girls, you know, you watch your princess. You want to be a princess. You dream. It's not hard for you to dream. Uh, you, you know what? You watch Commando. You want to be a commando. You, you wanted to be the hero. That's just how it is. You, you didn't have a problem with dreaming. But what happens as we get older, now the world says, well, you walked into reality. No, no, no. You let the world beat the dream out of you. But I love this. Despite what he went through, he dreamed again. And I'm here to say this, despite what you've been through, despite the battles, despite the, the, the fights, despite the storms, in spite the intimidating giants that are trying to pull you down, dream again. Can I say it again? Dream again. Dream again. Look at the person next to you say, dream again. Dream again. Dream again. Dreams are the language of God. Dreams are the language of God. People say to me all the time, I don't think God speaks to me. Well, can I ask you a question? Do you have dreams? It's the language of God. God's speaking to you. And so the thing is this, is that I'm here to say, you know what? Dream again. Dream again. I'm too old. Dream again. Oh, but you don't know what I've been through. Dream again. But, but I've been in some battles. Dream again. Dream again. Well, you don't know what, I, what I've been through. Man, I, I, I've been sick. Dream again. Well, the doctor said I would die. Dream again. I got some financial issues. Dream again. There's debt that's piling up, that they're coming, they're knocking on the door, they're saying I'm going to go bankrupt. Dream again. Dream again. Dream again. Huh. I was on a flight and I flew from Chicago summer in Germany and then from Germany to Kolkata and, and it was the first time and the only time I've ever been to India and I was doing a tour with Compassion the child sponsorship people this is a season Compassion no longer India because of law changes but we, we were flying into Kolkata and I, I remember on the flight just in that quiet moment because it was dark and everyone was trying to sleep but you know I'm in another time zone So, so I remember in a quiet moment, I said, God, would you show me, show me what true poverty is? Because, you, you know, they're all about dealing with the poverty. Uh, so, so I was like, God, can you just show me on this trip? It's going to be there for a week. They're going to give us a tour. We're going to do a number of different projects that they were dealing with and be inspired by what they did. And what happened was, is I... Uh, Landed Kolkata and we, we set up, went to the hotel and got some sleep. Next day we did a tour and then we went back to the hotel. Got into bed, tired. I'm ready to sleep. So I fall asleep very quickly. And I remember get woken up and, and it was two o'clock on the dot. Because I rolled over and there's the clock right there. For half an hour I was awake. The last time I looked at the clock was 2.30. But for half an hour, I felt like the greatest loser on the planet. And I looked at all the failures in my life. And I looked at all the things that I'd tried to achieve and fa uh, failed in. I, I, I looked at my life and just go, you know what? What have I done? What a waste of time. I went back to my childhood where I was raised in South Auckland. Moments I got filled with the Holy Ghost here in Auckland City. The times that I was a youth pastor on the North Shore of Auckland and I looked at all the things that I did and I said, what an utter failure you are. Hopeless. 
And it was, a, it was half an hour of me beating myself up. It was like every devil in hell that was on holiday came to visit me that night. And, and, and I felt worthless. I felt like there was no future before me. I even felt a failure as a husband, felt failure as a father. And I'm sitting in that moment, I, I, I fall asleep and, and, and I wake up in the morning. Now, now, I just wanna say this, is that in that half an hour between two and 2.30, every bit of hope, every bit of promise that I had departed my body, right? But as soon as I woke up in the morning, I had hope back. I was excited about my future. I was excited about a new day. I just thought maybe it was, I don't know, maybe it was the curry I had yesterday. I don't know what it was. Change in diet, maybe it's the water. Maybe I just took a drink of something I, I shouldn't have drunk or something like that. I carried on with my day. Later that afternoon, we went into uh, one of the slum places where Compassion was and we were to visit some of these Compassion kids. And I remember walking into one of the uh, places that, that, that there was a family of four, mum and dad, two teenagers. They had a teenage boy, teenage girl. And I think it was the boy that was being sponsored uh, through, through this. And they wanted to show us the house. We're talking a three meter house, three meter house. Right, three meters by three meters, all it was. Just, just a tight space, they had a bed in that place. Uh, Mum and daughter would sleep in the bed and uh, dad and son on the floor, right? How come they didn't have any more kids? Figure that one out, right? Uh, but, but that's all they had. It was just this tiny space there. There was no kitchen, uh, there was no... Uh, I mean, I'm talking poverty. I'm talking like, like poor is poor. And if you've traveled, you've been to some of these nations, you, you, you understand what I'm talking about. It's worthwhile any Christian from a Western world to go to some of these places, make it one of your bucket lists to see what the rest of the world live in. It's worthwhile for anyone to do that. What, what happens is, is that in this place of, of looking at this, at the end of us looking at that, I remember looking in the eyes of mum and dad. And I asked these questions. I said, what are the dreams that you have for your kids? And, and I saw them just, now, now they spoke a little bit of English, but, but they, they just, they, 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 were, they were stumped on what I was saying. I was like, do you have any like hopes? What, 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 what do you dream for your kids? Like, like I'm seeing the poverty of what they're in like, like, like here, here in this part of the planet, you, you dream of great things for your kids. Your kids one day, uh, you know what? Getting married, having some kids, having, being successful. Well, what if it, whatever field they're in, whether it's in business, but they're gonna do well. We dream in this part of the world. I'm asking these questions and I, I'm thinking to myself, maybe it's a translation issue. So I call the translator over and I said, can you ask them this question? Can you ask them, what dreams do you have for your kids? And, and at that moment, what happens is, is that they're kind of a little bit, they, they stop and stump. And, and, and I said, can, can you, do, do they not understand? Is, is it another, I don't know, dialect? What, what is going on? And he said, no, what you are gonna understand is this, is that their entire life they've lived in survival. They cannot see beyond today. Dad, Dad only earns less than $2 a day and all he can think about is how can I just get a little bit of food for us just to be able to serve? That they, they can think maybe and dream maybe into next week, but that, that's even beyond where they're at. They've never in their life been able to dream about the future because they're just in a world of survival. And that's when God spoke to me. You wanna know what true, true poverty is? Yeah, 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 it's partly to do with finances, but it's when you have no hope, no hope for a better day. And there are moments that we go through in our life where, you know what, we feel like, man, man, we've had this blow. We've been beaten up in this way. And what happens is that the dream is soaked up inside of us. Now, now I have no hope. Now, now we're living in poverty because we can't dream for a better day. And you know what, here's Joseph in a moment where he's been dreaming and he's been beaten up, but yet he dreamed again. And I'm here to tell you today, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you're going through, I wanna give you permission, dream again, dream again, dream, dream again. 
It's time to dream. It's time to dream again. About five years ago, we, we just shifted from one location to another. We, we were in a lease situation in our church and it's a pastor, it's a big deal. Going from, you imagine going from this building to another one. Maybe not, don't think about it at all. But you know what? That, 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 that's what we were going through. And, and I remember two, two days, I mean, on the day that we shifted everything out, right? The day we shifted, it, it was a long day, huge day where, uh, I mean, from nine in the morning to 11 o'clock at nine, back and forth, load after load, trying to get everything out of this building to one way down the road. And we're trying to reset that place at the same time. We're trying to clean the building up there. We're trying to get that place built over there. We, we've got works going on in both places. I'm trying to manage this, manage that. Then I'm also trying to carry the, the financial load of everything going on that place. And I just that day received an email from the, the landlord of the place we're exiting about bills that they haven't given us and we, we forgot to charge you this. And so, man, I'm doing the calculation and and what it was going to come to was about $15,000. I needed that $15,000 for works over here. He wants it over here. And and I'm thinking to myself, what? how the heck am I going to... I'm so tired. I hit the bed at 11 o'clock. I'm ready to sleep. I lie down. And guess what? My mind is now racing. You understand what I'm talking about? About this and what about that and what about this? And it was like every demon that was in hell came to visit me that night. And it was in that moment where my mind was racing, telling me that, you know what? You, you might shift, but guess what? You're not gonna be able to pay that bill. You're not gonna be able to pay that bill over there. And but by the way, you know what, you're gonna move it. No one's gonna come with you. What a useless pastor you are. You're gonna be the most embarrassment pastor that's ever lived on the Gold Coast. Man, the devil's turned up, I'm telling you, all night long. And I, I tell you, it wasn't a night where they whispered to me. Now they were shouting at me. You're hopeless. You're going to amount to nothing. You're going to be the embarrassment. Guess what? You, you, you're going to go, the church is going to go bankrupt. Then you're going to go bankrupt. Then your wife's going to leave you. You're going to have fights. And guess what? You're going to grow up. Your kids are going to hate you. And you're going to be an old grumpy man, lonely for the rest of your life. Now we may laugh at that. But if you've been down this pathway, you understand some of the anxiety that can go on. The thing that plays on the inside. What's happening is this dream gets sucked out of me. I didn't get a bit of sleep that night. And oh, okay, I lied because at 5.30 I did fall asleep. I had half an hour sleep. And when I woke up at six o'clock, I rolled over to my wife and I said, call the board, tell them I'm done. I'm done. I'm done with this thing. And I, I was freaking out. I'd retreated to my tent. I'm in that moment, I can't believe what's going on. Huh. Well, thankfully I had a very graceful board. So they'd take some time off. My oversight said, go and see a psychologist. I never believed in psychologists till I needed one. Remember my first meeting with the psychologist? And in that meeting, he asked me this question. He said, can you finish a coffee with your wife? He said, that's easy. That's easy. I mean, a cup, so big. That's the coffee man. I mean, it's, you know, oh, of course I can finish a coffee. It's not that. And he goes, think about it. Can you finish a coffee with your wife? Easy. That's easy. I can finish a coffee with my wife. Easy. He goes, we'll go and think about it. Well, that night, there I was. Now, now I'm taking some time. I'm preaching on the Sundays, but they let me have the week off and just to get some of my head space sorted, but I'd preach on Sundays, rest during the week, and I'm doing this. You finish a coffee with your wife. Yeah, easy. But that night, I was actually having a coffee with my wife. Well, in the middle of the coffee moment with my wife, my phone pings, and I pull it out, and I start looking at this, and that, that caused me to think about this, and that there I get to put, a, put, put that on my to-do list, and and then I better flick over to here and answer this and do this. And, and then I realize I can't finish a coffee with my wife. Now, now, physically, I can finish a coffee with my wife, but mentally, my mind's somewhere else. You're hearing what I'm saying? If you're one of these people that's just racing with ideas and things like that, you know what? You just, your mind's processing, you've got to do this, got to do this, got to do that, got to think about this. And you know, that, that thought pops in, and, and your mind's always racing. So the next week, I'm back with a psychologist. I brought it up with them. You asked me last week, could I finish a coffee with my wife? 
I said, I figured out, I can't finish your coffee with my wife. I told him the story. And he goes, well, you know what? What you need to learn, the problem in your world is that you've got to learn that when you're with your wife, you're with your wife. When you're with your kids, you're, you're with your kids. When you're doing your job, you're doing your job. But when, when, when you're doing ministry, you do ministry, but, but finish your coffee with your wife. You can have coffee in business. You can, you're hearing my heart and what I'm trying to say, but you've put your focus on attention. The problem is you're spreading yourself. That's where he went. So I've got great advice, all right? So a few days go by, I go into my Sunday to preach, normal Sunday morning, and not, nothing to, you know, just one of those normal mornings. Not, you know, it wasn't bad, it wasn't amazing. It was just a you know, normal great day in church. Well, I go home now, I'm tired. My sleep pattern's still all over the show. And Sunday afternoon, I mean, I, I do enjoy a good Sunday afternoon sleep. Any lovers of Sunday afternoon sleeps? So, so I, I go to bed, I'm tired. And I said to Rian, I said, I need to get some sleep. I said, um, so, so uh, I'm, 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 I'm going to just show up just before church. If you meet me down church, I said, my head's all over the space. Um, can, here's my mobile phone. And I, I handed her my mobile phone. Be my secretary. I don't want to be interrupted. Uh, and just leave my phone down there. I'll, I'll, I'll see you at church. So, so I said, I'll, I'll, I'll get some sleep. Then I'll do some praying. My final message prep, I'll see you at church. So, so what happens? She takes my phone. She goes downstairs. Right, so I lie down in bed, pull up the donor and uh, duvet, uh, pu- pull it up, and, and, and there, there I am, just, just struggling in bed. But my mind's racing. And I was like, well, if I can't sleep, then, then I might as well pray. So I sit up and start praying on the Holy Ghost. I mean, I'm just praying on the Holy Ghost. And as I'm praying on the Holy Ghost, thought drops in my mind about something I needed to do that I forgot to tell my PA to organize. So I, I, gotta, I gotta sort that out, right? And so I, I go, just lean over to get a hold of my phone so I can send her a text message. And I'm like, where's my phone? And I was like, where's my phone? I'd forgotten. I don't know how long it had been at that point, but where's my phone? And then I realized my wife took it downstairs. I told her, be my secretary. And then I heard the word of the Lord. You can't even finish your coffee with me. It wasn't that I wasn't praying. It wasn't that I wasn't reading my word. But, but I was allowing other things to bring distraction in my world, spreading myself thin across the place. And, and, and I say all this because tonight, I want us to finish a coffee with Jesus. I want us to spend some time with Jesus and not allow the distractions of what's going on in our world to invade Him from bringing a dream back again. Because whatever you've been going through, whatever fights, whatever storms, whatever you're facing has robbed you of every dream. And see, when the dream comes out of your heart, what happens is you stop believing. Now now I step into a place where I'm just living in survival. You're now in that tent. God was saying to you tonight, I want you to get out of your survival zone, get out of the tent. I want you to stand on the mountaintop. I want you to look up. I want you to count the stars. Because every one of those stars is a promise of what I've called to you into. And I want to say this, is that, you know what? I'm calling you out tonight to dream again. I'm calling you out to stand on the mountaintop, see the promises that I have for you. The life you're living now is far lower than the life that I've created for you, called you into. I'm calling you out of your tent into a beautiful day. Dream again. I give you permission. Dream again. It says in Joel 28, and repeated in Acts 2, 17, it says, In the last days, God will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams. Young men will have visions. I'm here to tell you, dream again. Dream again. At 19, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. I, I, I'd been raised under the poverty line in South Auckland. And I tell you, the first thing that I noticed happen is my dream machine turned on the inside of me and I started dreaming about what God would do in and through my life. Guess what? I was the main actor in the middle of that movie. It wasn't in, in, in low definition. It was high definition. I'm talking 4K. There I was in that place and I saw God do incredible things in and through my life. I dreamed because I'd been filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'm telling you this, that you know what? When, when we get under, as Brent used to say many, long, many years ago, get under the spout where the Holy Ghost comes out. 
I don't know if you remember that. Remember the, the one that used to say, uh, Holy Ghost, you're the most, I want to eat you on my toes. Do you remember that one? I don't remember, I remember that one. I just want to say this. What have you gone through? Tonight, let's get under the, get, get under that spell. That, let's believe for the outpouring of God to hit us again, for us to dream again. But I've been beaten up by the de- devil. Dream again. But you don't understand how poor I am. Dream again. Pastor, my wife left me. Dream again. My kids hate me. Dream again. I'm depressed. Dream again. I'm anxious. Dream again. Dream again. It's time to dream again. Time to dream again. Time to dream again. Time to dream again. Dream again. Dream again. Come. Dream again.